Good morning, everybody. Um, hopefully, the, uh, the technical issues have been sorted out. Um, and whatever you could hear, however you could worship this morning, I just hope that it, it blessed you. I just hope the Holy Spirit has touched you. And I just hope now through this word this morning that the Holy Spirit can continue to challenge you this morning, but also give you the courage to be able to not only listen and hear, um, but also give you the courage to be able to apply God's word into, into, your, into your lives. Um, turn with me. We'll go directly into God's word. If you turn with me to Exodus 20, I'm going to be reading from the uh, New International Version. And we're actually in the, uh, as Emil mentioned earlier on, we're actually in the, co- uh, the series of the covenants. Um, so I'm going to be reading directly from uh, Exodus 20. Um, when you're there, just shout at the screen. Um, I'm sure I'll be able to hear you some way. Okay. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for, for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You should not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you 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 shall not do any work, Neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea, and all in, all in them. But he, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honour your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land of the Lord is given you. The Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not cover your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When the neighbor... When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to his people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites this, you have seen for yourselves that I have spoken to you from heaven. Do not make any gods to be alongside me. Do not make yourself gods of silver or gold or gods of gold. Make an altar of earth for me and sacrifice it on your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, your sheep and goats and your cattle. Wherever I cause my name to be honored, I will come to you and bless you. If you make an altar of stones to me, for me, do not build it with dressed stones, for you will defile it. And if you use a tool on it, and do not go up to my altar on the steps or on your private parts may be exposed. Lord, I just thank you for, for keeping us safe through the night, Lord. I thank you that you have woke us up to this beautiful new day. And in Matthew and Luke, Lord, you remind us that heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will never pass away. Lord, I just pray that, Holy Spirit, you take this word and deliver it wherever you need it to be delivered. Lord, have your way in and through this word so it challenges us and we have the courage to apply it in our lives to bring you all the glory in your glorious name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so the UK um, set up the Law Commission in 1965 and its purpose was to update our country's legal system and push for reforms. And since it's been established, 
Over 2,000 outdated laws have been abolished. However, not all of them have. And when I was looking at them, I was thinking, some of the rules are so old and some of the rules are so crazy and outdated. They must have just thought, there's no need to change these at all. I'm going to read a few out. Are you ready? Okay, first one. It is illegal to enter the Houses of Parliament wearing a suit of armour. And this statute has been in place from the year 1313. So the next time you want to visit London, right, and potentially visit the Houses of Parliament, just leave your suit of armour hanging up in your wardrobe and go with your jeans. There'll be no drama, I'm sure, whatsoever. It is legal, not illegal, but legal, and forgive me if you're Scottish and you're watching or you're tuning in at a later time. It is legal to shoot a Scotsman under certain circumstances. Remember, we've just read out, thou shalt not murder, so bear that in mind first of all, okay? It is legal to shoot a Scotsman under certain circumstances. Do you want to know what those circumstances are? Yeah. Right, okay. These are the Only... <laughs> In the city of York, the law states it is legal to shoot a Scotsman with a crossbow upon seeing one, except on a Sunday. <laughs> so today, no. And yeah, don't wait till tomorrow either, but you know, if you see one with a crossbow, yeah, just don't even, don't go there whatsoever. Okay. It is illegal to gamble in a library. <laughs> The, the Library of Fences Act of 1898 makes it illegal to gamble in a library. So if you was to go into a library and gamble online using an electronic device, it would be against the law. It's against the law to shake a carpet. Under the Metropolitan Police Act of 1839, <laughs> it's illegal to beat... <laughs> or shake a mat, or a carpet, or a rug in the streets of London town, right? It is illegal to drive under the influence of alcohol. Now we know that, right, we know that. However, it is illegal to drive under the influence of alcohol and, <laughs> and operate a cow. <laughs> Okay. So when you've had a drink, whatever you do, don't go out into the fields and start operating a cow. <laughs> this is why they've left them in place. They're just crazy, right? It's illegal. <laughs> it's illegal to handle salmon <laughs> in a suspicious circumstance. <laughs> <laughs> Under the Salmon Act. And this is a crazy thing. The Salmon Act was brought into play in 1986, so it's not even that old. So it is illegal to handle a salmon in suspicious circumstances. When you go to Asda and you ask for a salmon, don't handle it in suspicious circumstances. Say thank you, pop it in your basket and carry on walking. Because under the Salmon Act of 1986, it's illegal to handle it in... <laughs> yeah. Uh, right, anyway, right. Whether or not our opinion of these laws are justified or not, our God is just. Our God is righteous and our God is holy. Psalm 89 tells us righteousness and justice are the foundation of God's throne. We stand and we live and we breathe this morning as we are reminded in Romans 3.24. It tells us that we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption of of Christ Jesus. Last time we spent a bit of time, family, looking through the Abrahamic covenant. This morning I'd like to spend a bit of time with you going through this morning the Mosaic covenant, the covenant of law and what it shows us. So Abraham's covenant was the first one with the nation of Israel, but it was followed by a second one, the covenant with Moses. There are four main elements along with the law uh, in the Mosaic Covenant. There's the exodus, there's the sealing of the old covenant, there's the giving of the law and the old covenant rituals. Now sometimes in the 21st century, the covenant has not always been seen in the most positive light. And some actually ask, is it relevant today, this side of the cross? Well, yes, 
It certainly is because the Moses, Moses covenant plays a pivotal and vital role in the positive redemption of the human race. It was designed as a temporary administrator. It was designed as a supervisor covenant, which held the Abrahamic covenant in place until the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant could be fulfilled in our Lord and our Saviour, Lord Jesus. And this morning, I'm going to take a look at what it highlights in a, in a slightly different way. I want to take a look at what it highlights through the eyes of the ones who really depended on it more in their day, depending on the covenant more. I want to have a look through the eyes of, of the prophets. So first, we need to understand when it comes to God, God's covenant with Moses. Many of us today, many Christians today, have a false impression. They believe that this covenant was centred around good works. But it wasn't. And we can see it plainly in the fact that the Ten Commandments that we've just read out begins with a a historical layout of what's happened before. So before any commandments are actually given in Exodus chapter 20, verse 2, we read these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. God expected his people to obey him, yes, 100%, of course. But it was on the basis of his acts of mercy in bringing them out of the land of Egypt. And of course, on the other side of the coin is our responsibility, the act of human responsibility, which also appears in the covenant of Moses. Exodus 19.5 tells us, now if you obey me fully and keep keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured, possession. Here we see divine grace infused with human responsibility in the covenant of Moses. The Old Testament, the Old Testament prophets were very, very appreciative of Moses and his law because, because his law provided the main standards, the moral standards by which the prophets actually evaluated the nation of Israel. Prophets involved the covenant in reminding Israel of her responsibility to be faithful to the law of Moses. Even the specific blessings and curses which the prophets announced upon Israel and on the people of God, even these came largely from the covenant with Moses. A plasterer, for example, a plasterer, they have an inside and outside trowel. They have a mortar stand. They have a mixing bucket. They have a trusty bucket trowel, which they use over and over again. And then they have a finishing trowel of tools of their trade. The law of Moses is the primary tool of the prophet's trade. If God is calling you to something, he'll give you the tools to succeed. The inspiration to the prophets, it came from the spirit of God according to the grace and revelation that each prophet was granted by God. John Wesley, who was known as a Methodist, now basically he was known as a Methodist because he had a method. And his his, his method used to be he would go into a village or into a town and he would preach nothing but the Ten Commandments for ten days. He wouldn't preach on Jesus it would just purely focus upon the, on the, the Ten Commandments for 10 days. Why did he do that? He'd done that to show people and allow the Holy Spirit to work and convict the people of their shortfalls, of their failings, of how, how short that they fall. Now, I can hear some of you groaning through the camera and through the system saying, no Jesus, no Jesus. Well, Romans 3, 23 tells us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The covenant of Moses focuses on the law of God. The law of God that provides the regulations in essence that will govern covenant life in Israel. The covenant itself appears mostly in Exodus chapters 9, 19 sorry, to 24 where the covenant was initiated with the book of the covenant. Then as we've just read, the Ten Commandments. But it also shows up in the worship regulations in the book of Leviticus. The book of Deuteronomy, it records Israel's covenant renewal near the time of Moses' death. When you strip it all away, 
The Mosaic Covenant focused on the regulations of covenant life. The laws by which would lead to blessing and or to curses from our great divine King that we serve our Lord and our Saviour. Look at when Isaiah wanted to indicate the people that had been unfaithful to the Lord. He appealed to the Mosaic law as an authoritative standard. And as he said in Isaiah 5.24, they have rejected the law of the Lord Almighty. This kind of reference to Moses and his law appears numerous times over and over again in the books of the prophet. Because Old Testament prophets were messengers of God, calling Israel to account for the way she had violated the covenant with Moses. God is infinitely and unchangeably right, and he is perfect in all that he does. It's an attribute of God, and God often had his prophets announce that judgment was coming. And one of the ways was in the form judgment in nature. Judgment in nature. Deuteronomy 28, 15 to 16. However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I am giving you today, all these curses will come up upon you and overtake you. You will be cursed in the city and cursed in the country. So the first type of covenant judgment is that God would respond to persistent sin with judgment in nature. God threatens to remove his blessing from the natural order so that the world would become hostile to the people of God. So God brought Israel to the land flowing with milk and honey. The natural order in the promised land was going to be a true, true blessing to the Israelites and the people of God. But the prophets warned that when Israel rebels, he will remove the blessing in judgment. Deuteronomy chapter 4, Deuteronomy chapter 28, 29 and 32. Even in Leviticus chapter 26, it lists major, major types of natural judgments against the people of God. These chapters of the book of Moses tell us that God will sometimes send drought to the land of Israel. And then the drought would dry up the land so the people would suffer. Then there would be pestilence famine and also the people would have no food when they rebel so blatantly against the Lord and disease would come upon them they would receive fevers they would receive boils they would receive tumors they would receive plagues and the prophets mention these kind of covenant judgments over and over and over again they often warned that God was going to bring some natural disaster to this disrupt life in the promised land Listen to what God said in Haggai 1, 9 to 11. My house remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with his own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew, and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains on the grain. The new wine, the oil, and whatever the grain produces of men and cattle, and on the labour of the hands. So, hopefully you can see this. Everyone else can see this in the room, right? I've got a coin, yeah? And I probably could go all spiritual. It's probably another sermon for a different time, but there's two sides to the coin. One's a head and one's a tail. We are the head and not the tail. That's a completely different sermon. This side of the coin is judgment in nature. But if we flip the coin, if one side is judgment in nature... And we flip that coin and we obey God and not disregard his laws and his commands. On the other side of the coin, we then see the blessing in nature. Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 2 tells us, If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on the earth. These blessings will come to you and accompany you if 
you obey the Lord your God. The first of the blessings is the blessing in nature. Just as Moses spoke about judgment in nature, he also spoke a blessing would come in the natural realm also. Moses revealed to Israel that God offered amazing natural blessings if they would only serve the Lord faithfully. This pattern appears numerous times in numerous ways, again throughout the book of Deuteronomy 4, 28, 30, and all the way across into Leviticus 26. First, Moses spoke about agricultural plenty. The fields would be full of crops if the people would be faithful to the Lord. Also, he speaks of livestock having fertility. The livestock will grow in great numbers if the people would serve the Lord faithfully. Health and prosperity would come to the people of God. They would enjoy general health and well-being. And in addition to this, a step further, the population would increase. A declaration, a blessing, it really, really shouldn't surprise us, really, at all. Where did God first set us when he created humanity? In the paradise in the Garden of Eden. And what drove us out? It was sin. When God's people are faithful to him, he promises to give them blessings. Blessings in nature. So that they can experience the kind of things God meant for the human race to have in the very, very beginning. 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. If we want this community of Kingshurst, if we want this community of Marston Green, of Chalmsley Wood, of Kozel, of Smith's Wood, of Shard End, if we want these communities that we're surrounded by here to be healed, if we want this city to be healed, if we want this nation to be healed, we must turn away from our wicked ways. We must seek his face and he is faithful to forgive and heal our land. Listen to Joel in Joel 2. 22 to 23. Do not be afraid, O wild animals, for the open pastures are becoming green. The trees are bearing their fruit. The fig tree, the vine yield their riches. Be glad, O people of Zion. Rejoice, rejoice in the Lord your God. And he has given you the autumn rains in righteousness. Also, Zechariah predicted that the people in his day would see the blessings of God when they just obeyed the Lord. Zechariah 8.12 tells us, The seed will grow well. The vine will yield its fruit. The ground will produce its crops. And the heavens will drop their dew. There is a process to repairing. When you take your car into the garage, let's say the head gasket has gone. There's been a few times where I blew my head gasket when I was younger before I was saved. And I won't tell you exactly why. I'll leave that to your own imagination. But the head gasket blew a couple of times in my car. I didn't take it to the garage and say, my head gasket's blew. And then they started the repair work by removing the driver's seat. No, they started the repair work in the right place by knowing what we needed to do, what they needed to do to get to the problem. If we are in a cycle of sinning at the moment, we need to turn away from our wicked ways. We need to repent. We need to seek his face. And he is faithful to heal our land. The next thing that the the, the Mosaic Covenant shows us is judgment in warfare. Deuteronomy 28, 49 to 50 tells us that the Lord will bring nation against you from afar from the ends of the earth like the eagle swooping down, and nations whose language you will not understand, a fierce-looking nation without respect for the old or pity for the young. In addition to judgment in nature, we also find that the prophets announce judgment in warfare. War, it so often brings about disaster, natural, just horrific horrors, Death, and then famine, and then disease. We clearly see that God 
did also speak about sending human enemies against his people as a kind of covenant judgment. A number of warfare patterns emerge and appear in the writings of Moses. First, the people of God will suffer defeat. They will not be, they will not be able to withstand the attacks of their enemies. Second, sieges would be laid upon their cities. Cities would be surrounded by their enemies and the people who live in those cities would suffer. Then there would be occupation of the land by enemies. Enemies of God's people will come into the land of promise and take complete control. Death and destruction is another covenant curse in warfare because many of God's people will die at the hand of their enemies. And finally, probably the worst of all, the worst, cor- the worst curse, God says that his people will be taken captive and scattered among the, the nations in exile. Time and time again, the prophets not only announced that the people of God would be defeated by their enemies, but they also warned that exile from the promised land was coming. The prophet Micah warned that the Judites would be exiled from the land of promise. Micah 1.16 Shave your heads in mourning for your children in whom you delight. Make yourselves as bored as a vulture for they will go from you in exile. Fretch Threats of judgment and warfare like these appear throughout the whole of the Old Testament through the prophets. How many sides does a coin have? Two sides. So if one side of the coin is judgment in warfare, if you flip the coin and you obey God, then comes the the blessing in warfare. Deuteronomy 28.7 states, The Lord will grant that your enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction, but then flee from you in seven. The number seven. Totality of perfection and completeness. Obedience to the Lord will make our enemies flee in the totality of perfection. A complete retreat. No remnants left over. So although the first type of blessing focuses on natural blessing, the blessing of warfare appears time and time again through the prophets. Just as the people of the covenant suffered defeat in war when they were under God's judgment, they experienced victory and they experienced peace when they were under the blessings of the covenant. Again and again, there's the pattern that's evident in, again, Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 28, 30, Leviticus 26. Firstly, Moses tells the people of God that they would defeat their enemies. But a step past this, that there would be an end to warfare and hostility with the nations would totally cease and that there would be relief from destruction. And of course, there would be return of any captives who had been taken away from the land of promise. Old Testament prophets often spoke of these kinds of blessings in warfare. Amos, he predicted a grand future of military success for the nation of Israel. In the book of Amos 9, 11 to 12, he said these words about the post-exilic period. On that day, I will restore David's fallen tent. I will repair its broken places and build it as it is used to be, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name. In a world of hostilities, In a world of troubles, the prophet Amos announced that the house of David would see and have victory over all hostile enemies. And in in much the same way, Micah 4.3 announced that there would be great peace as a result of these victories. They will beat their swords into plowshares 
and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for warfare anymore. So we can see, church, from these passages that the prophets orientated and placed themselves towards the grace and the blessings of God. Although the prophets, we know, had much negative to say about judgment and about sin, the prophets also said that repentance and fidelity to the Lord would lead to great blessings in both nature and both war. Now I know, I know that we're not at physical warfare in this country, but we are certainly in a spiritual warfare. Ephesians 6.12 tells us, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. But the Lord has gained complete victory over sin. He's gained complete victory over death. He's gained complete victory over Satan. Because of what Christ did and what he accomplished in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection, and because of Christ's victory is ours by faith, for we are his body. We are identified with him and he is identified with us. I've been blessed with a book very, very recently by, by an author called Julius Subi. And he in his book, Julius Subi, puts it in a fantastic way. The book's called Unbeatable Prayer. God has given us the most powerful weapons in spiritual warfare that no demon in the gates of hell can withstand. The name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and the word of God. Ephesians 6.1 tells us, stand firm with the belt buckle of truth around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can ex- extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Notice that this armour that we are to fit ourselves with, it's not our own armour. It's the armour of God. Paul tells us to be strong in the Lord. The Hebrew breastplate, the priestly breastplate, only covered the front. There is nothing covering the back of a Christian. And why is that? Because this battle belongs to God. God has got our back because our role is to advance his name. Our role is uh, is to advance his kingdom. Our role is to take the banner of Christ forward, defeating the powers and principalities of darkness and trusting in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. We fight because we are saved. We do not fight because we are trying to be saved. We do not fight to remain saved. We fight because we are saved. And that leads me on to the last point, divine patience. Leviticus 26, it tells us, but if they confess their sins, and the sins of their ancestors, their unfaithfulness, their their hostility towards me, which made me hostile towards them, so that I sent them into the land of their enemies. When their uncircumcised hearts are humbled, uncircumcised hearts, just amazing. When their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they pay for their sin, I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac, and my covenant with Abraham. And I will remember the land, for the land will be deserted by them, and will enjoy its Sabbath while it lies desolate without them. They will pay for their sins because they rejected my laws and arbored my decrees. Yet, yet, in spite of this, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them or arbor them so as to destroy them completely, breaking my covenant with them, 
I am the Lord their God. But for their sake, I will remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought out of Egypt in the sight of the nations to be their God. I am the Lord. These are the decrees, the laws, and the regulations of the Lord established at Mount Sinai between himself and the Israelites through Moses. God is gracious. God is patient. God is kind to his people. It takes a long time for him to get angry, church, but he can be provoked into anger. And so we discover that God does have judgment over his people, but he's, it's a patient and it's a kind judgment that he exercises over his people. God intended to be patient with his people by giving them as many opportunities for repentance. The center, the very center of every divine covenant in the Bible was God's kindness towards his people. The old covenant law testified to the perfect holiness of our God and what God demands. He also trained the Israelites to look for a savior. It was not through keeping the law that the ancient Israelites were commanded to seek salvation. As with us, their doing of good works, as outlined in scripture, was to be the way which they thanked God for saving them. We are to do good works, and the old covenant law can guide us in the kinds of works that pleases our Lord. The Mosaic covenant is founded on grace. The Mosaic covenant is offering forgiveness and upholding the covenant by loving God and not putting any other value where God belongs fully in your heart. We've just completed 40 days of fasting and prayer. We've just completed seeking the Lord and putting him firmly back where he belongs, as first in our lives, as the king of our lives, as the Lord of our lives. So church now, do not step back into slavery. He has made a way out of it for you because he is a way maker. Do not go back through the waters that the Lord has already parted for you and allowed in your grace to walk through because he is a miracle worker. Do not go backwards out of the promised land the Lord has given you and given us. Stand on his promise because he is a promise keeper. If you still now find yourself in a place after these 40 days, that is identical to how the earth was in the beginning of creation, void, empty, and in darkness. And your darkness is all around you, surrounding you. Allow the Lord to do what he did in creation. Allow him to do what he did back in Genesis and speak light into the voidness. Allow God to speak light into your emptiness. Allow God to speak light into your darkness because he is the light in our darkness. That is who he is. I just want to ask the worship team to, to come up as we just close in prayer. Lord, I just, I just thank you that you are patient, God. You are a loving God. You are a kind God. You are the God of covenant. I thank you that justice and righteousness are the foundation of your throne. I thank you that you are a just God. You are a merciful God. You are a holy God. And I thank you for the covenants, Lord, that we can look at those and, and see that there are standards that we can live by that please you today still, Lord. I thank you that you have brought us out of our wilderness, out of slavery, that you have guided us through the wilderness, that you have brought us to a promised land, Lord. And 
Holy Spirit, I just ask you this morning, if we feel that we are still in a place of voidness, of darkness, of emptiness, pray, Holy Spirit, that you speak directly to us. Lord, in your infinite wisdom, in your infinite glory, in your infinite power, in your sovereign love, I ask that you open our ears. Circumcise our hearts, Lord. Connect our hearts to yours. Allow us to hear what you are trying to tell us. Give us the strength, Holy Spirit, to apply that into our lives so you receive all the glory. Lord, I just thank you again for another day that you have blessed us with. I thank you for your mercies of today, Lord. I thank you for your grace. I thank you that you are a loving Father. Lord, I thank you that you died for all on a cross. I thank you for your burial. I thank you for your resurrection. And I thank you as we are here this morning now, lifting the holy name of Jesus, that you are seated at the right hand of our Abba Father in heaven, interceding for us. And thank you that we can cry out to you. And we have a God that has gone through every temptation that we have gone through. We have a God that's walked through darkness as we have walked through darkness, that has experienced emptiness as we have, Lord. We lift up your holy name, Lord Jesus. We exalt you and ask for you to be the way maker. We declare that you are a miracle worker. We declare that you are a promise keeper. We declare that you are a miracle worker and the light in our darkness. For you are our God and that is who you are. And we praise you, Jesus, in your holy name. Have your way. In Jesus' glorious name. Amen.